Welcome to the Bro Show Live. Welcome back, Ed. What is going on, everybody? We got a full one tonight. Welcome, Ed. Thank you for coming back and uh, chit chatting with us again. We appreciate you. Um, fighting through the technical difficulties and making it through is uh, uh, a thing we deal with every week now that we have a guest every week. So uh, we appreciate you handling all that. And well, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be with such uh, enthusiastic people. <laughs> How can we not be enthusiastic to have a legend on here? Right? Exactly. It's great having you on, brother. Yeah, thank we'll you so much again. for coming back. Red, your hair looks phenomenal tonight, I got to say. Uh, it's it's freshly washed. Don't don't let it fool you. It's still shining wet. So <laughs> nothing special about it. No beard oil in there. Trying to, trying to let it dry out for the moment. So. It's like magician hair. Yeah, if I tie it up now, it'll be wet through Tuesday. So don't want it to rot out. Right. So, Ed, what's been going on lately? Anything new with you? I've started working on a new project, which is to uh, uh, do some experiments o over at the uh, University of Mississippi, and we're making arrangements for that. They're trying, you know, they, they've been using a Mexican variant that is not very uh, potent for many, many years. Yeah, and Ed, can you quickly give the uh, audience a background on what makes University of Mississippi special as far as cannabis goes? The original. The University of Mississippi is one of the, up until recently, it was the only place that was allowed to grow uh, cannabis for uh, use in uh, science experiments and uh, for other things like that, that government projects. And uh, it, as I said, it was a very low grade variant and I've uh, helped them acquire uh, seeds from uh, Humboldt Seed Company, and uh, that is going to uh, in, improve the quality of, of their uh, product. And uh, my, my co-author, Rob Flannery, and I are going to be going down there sometime this spring to help uh, reorganize the, the grow room there. They're not, primarily, they're not primarily botanists. Most of the people there are chemists. So that they, they're growing the cannabis to use in uh, their experiments. I remember reading that the variety that they was using were, or that they were using was testing at less than 10% THC. Does that have more to do with like their horticulture practices or is it the genetics? It's the genetics. It, 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 it tested very, very low. It was, it, it, it was embarrassing. I think if, if I was growing that, I'd be embarrassed by it. <laughs> so was it like eight wow. this guy selecting that <laughs> i wonder who like sold them on those genetics they're like the guys these are the ones to well you know they were very controlled by the d what they could do by the dea so they had that had they had a lot to do with it dea and imh and, uh, of course uh, times have changed and the situation has changed and the experiments are changing so mm -hmm. they have to get with it so what HSO strains are you bringing in? I'm very curious to know about that. I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I really, uh, I sent the seed so a while ago and uh, I just, um, uh, I just don't remember. Hopefully but, something more than 10% though, right? <laughs> I know how that is, Rhett. Well, 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 well uh, it's humble, you know, humble seed. So yeah. 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 Good. yeah. Nice. And, I'm, and they're I'm very sure. enthusiastic about this too. I mean, it's it's really a good project, and I think that it will be good for people all over the United States and the world. They were the, yeah. one of the first breeders I ordered online. You know, from Amsterdam back in the day. You know, ordering them overseas. I think it was Blue Dream. One of the first strains I grew was Humboldt Seed Organization. Yeah. I'm really excited to hear about this, Ed, because that's one of my biggest complaints. Um, is that I think our biggest hurdle in the cannabis industry is just the ignorance of people on cannabis and even our own ignorance we're still trying to figure things out on this plant and i used to always gripe that the only plants that are even available for our scientists to even look at are, are garbage plants they need to get some good plants to, to see well, the medicinal qualities of everything and not 
So I'm excited to hear that there's going to be somebody there that knows how to fucking grow and is going to well, bring in some genetics and then use that well, for studying. What happened was uh, the informal, the industry, it started doing its own experiments. They, they said, well, we don't need the government to do this stuff anymore. <laughs> right. Self-fund. And, you know, there are any number of magazines such as uh, terpene, test, testing and terpenes. And uh, there are a couple of uh, other uh, science-based journals that are uh, science-based magazines. So uh, uh, there's so much work going on uh, independently of uh, the, go the government researchers that they're, they're just a small portion of what's going on. For instance, uh, recently, um, uh, recently, uh, researchers found that, uh, you know, that uh, when pl years ago, plants had, you could open up a, ba a bag and the room would smell up and you couldn't get rid of the smell. Did you ever experience that kind of thing? Every and, you know, day, baby. <laughs> I mean, when's the last time you experienced that? It was probably a while ago. And, um, and that's because uh, the, Taste the rainbow. The, the, that that um, the chemistry for that is uh, sul uh, sulfur chemistry, not the chemistry that uh, we've been researching m most. And so, uh, uh, I hope that we will be able to bring back some of those uh, really skunky and very uh, um, powerful varieties that. I think that the sulfur itself, those sulfur compounds, might have some sort of uh, effect on us. So as well. powerful in what way, though? I mean, are are you strict? I mean, it sounds like you're talking about smell, which you know to me is terpenes, right? But we we also talked about ten percent THC is super low. So are you just talking about high cannabinoid content in general, or or high terpene specifically, or what are, what are you looking to bring back? Well, there's a uh, chemistry that has been sort of lost. And that is that it's not terpene chemistry, but it, but it has an odor. And it's that very, very strong, sometimes skunky, but, you know, over, oh, almost overpowering chemistry, you know, odors. And you probably haven't had that in, in anything that you've experienced recently. Because that that was inadvertently bred out of it. Well, there's an era where like all cannabis growing was illegal, so all the breeders were trying to grow stuff like Northern Lights that didn't smell that much, and so you got more and more breeding for stuff that you could grow and not get busted before carbon filters were a big thing and um, other advancements that let people grow, like legalities, for example. Now we can grow the firest fire that we can find and not get in trouble for it, so it's not something that we're trying to actively breed out of the plants but, but i think just just as we bred it out i think we can find that lost chemotype by breeding for we sure try to get it back uh we will get it back well that that's one thing that i've been working on and uh um, um also uh uh work uh working with somebody i'm sort of uh uh executive producer of a book on growing mushrooms. Now, I'm not providing that information. I'm just trying to help organize it and get get it in into a book form. So, yeah, get, let in your experience as a uh, many time book producer. Is book it many writer. kinds of mushrooms or it focuses on one type? It, it focuses, well, there are two books, I hope, out of it. One is focusing on the different on the different varieties and it would be more it wouldn't be as much for uh for growers as for uh consumers and the other book would be generally on uh easy ways to grow mushrooms i like it uh, that's awesome in, in uh ho at home or in small co commercial operations perfect that's i like that interest to us here in michigan because we can do that legally in, in different areas Hey, Ed, what's your favorite uh, mushroom variety that you've had? Uh, well, I re recently had, uh, I was at this mushroom convention that was held in Oakland, and a lot of the uh, uh, people who were 
it was it was small. It was about a hundred people or so, and a lot of them knew each other from this inner mushroom community. And so I was given a uh, it was called a, a tiger tail, and uh, it, it had a, a little bit of variegation. Um, I think it was. Uh, you know, the people are breeding now. I, I don't know exactly how they're doing it, but they're breeding them. And so there are all these new varieties. So there, was, there wasn't one person who mentioned Cubensis, for instance. That's <laughs> <You know? laughs> crazy, right? That, that, we'll be lost. That, we'll be lost after that. Like, what? <laughs> that was the equivalent of a land race or something. Are they uh, cultivating more, like regular edible strains of mushrooms or just psychedelic mushrooms is that a well problem? this was con this this conference was about uh uh wasn't about edibles but i'm sure a lot of the technology is the same mm -hmm. in, in cultivation but they were talking about both um both the effects of the different mushrooms and uh, uh different methods of cultivation and then they were getting into pretty esoteric stuff so i can't wait to get those books when they come out man i'm right on those ones there are a lot of good books Dude, they're out there now yeah i, I will tell, say that there are a lot of good books on, on uh here's on, one on, yeah but it's not ed's though that's the whole thing here's one i can recommend right here let's go Bo. uh God, this is hard organic mushroom farming and micro remediation right on who's the author tread cotter okay i have not seen that one yet yes this is and, a great and, and, uh, you see those morels on the bottom, though. Mm -hmm. and, and we do uh, publish um, uh, uh, psilocybin uh, mushroom gro grower's handbook and psilocybin mushroom grower's guide. And uh, uh, so both of those books, we, we've already dipped our hands in it for many years. Uh, so uh, we'd like to get more into that. But Had you ever uh, I really think any blowback trying to publish a book like the early cannabis books? Did you have uh, get anyone writing you uh, protest in the books or anything like that? Well, well, I could go into it for it will take a, a few minutes. But uh, so uh, when the first two books that I wrote were published by a company uh, called um, Ronin. And this company uh, was run by somebody who, I don't know, he must have been pretty forgetful. He forgot that he did several print runs and forgot to pay royalties on them. So my co-author and I left him. My co-author kept the book Marijuana Grower's Guide and uh, published it himself. And I published uh, a small book called Marijuana Grower, Grower's Handbook. And now that the latest edition of that is called Cannabis Growers Handbook. Uh, but, uh, and uh, when, so I had the book prepped, it was ready to go to print. And uh, this is his first book. And this was in, um, in the early 80s. And I tried to get it, find a printer, and no printer would touch the book because it had marijuana in it. And it took me six months to get a printer unbelievable it was just you know i had the money i had the everything ready to what go what year was this wow that's crazy it uh it was so early 80s okay yeah so um and then um uh i would get calls from um uh, stores once we started publishing uh, we did find a distributor. I found a distributor and we started getting them into stores. And then okay, there was this Operation Green Merchant where the, the government tried to close up all the head shops, uh, not head shops, but all the grow stores. And um, they said, well, if you sell items and you talk about marijuana or you have any indicia of marijuana, then this, all this material is for marijuana and we're closing your store. So I, so we had to find a new way of distributing the books rather than through the grow stores. And that's how they're all in bookstores now. And then um, 
And then the bookstores, I get a, a call maybe four or five a year from book, a bookstore owner. And he says, the police just came by and said, I shouldn't carry your book. And what should I do? And I said, well, uh, do you believe in freedom of the press? Right. And say, yes. And I'd say, well, then you should carry the book and tell the cops to go fuck themselves. Hell yeah. Yeah, man. Really? That, Hell yeah. That really Get out of my store. Uh... You, don't like, you don't like the books? Don't oh, yeah. buy them. Right. Yeah, what is that? Censorship? Like the, the books? Buy all of them. Yeah, buy them all. Get them out of my shop. That's the only way yeah. to get them out. Is buying them all. Don't worry about that. That's what I really love your, about your book. That's is awesome. in, the beginning, in the beginning of your book, how they go over your activism. I really love that part myself. It's mm -hmm. kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, and before the show, you were talking about the Last Prisoner Project. Um, so if you want, to, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes. Well, you know, uh, we, we were all just enjoying some talks. Um, just a few minutes ago, right? Everyone, all of us, yeah. right? Yeah. And Absolutely. for the same thing, or for uh, or for uh, helping people to obtain it, uh, there are people who are still in prison. Unbelievable that some people are getting rich from it, and other people for doing the same thing are serving time in prison. Nobody should be in prison for cannabis. Just nobody. There isn't a reason for it, and. Um, uh, and often it's uh, there's a racial side to it as well. Sometimes a gender side to it. Sometimes the cops just don't like somebody or the prosecutor or the judge. When I was on trial, the prosecutor and the judge had a private meeting. And who knows what they discussed at that private meeting. You know, the judge, if we had found out about this earlier, that judge could have been removed for that. Yeah, or you drive it's through a county with the wrong. Just unbelievable. Yeah. So yeah. The, the conspiracy of the government against cannabis. And here's another one. It's, this isn't exactly about prisoners, but we all know that marijuana helps medically and has it has an effect on cancers, right? Absolutely. So the government knew it for years, and they they even uh, they even patented. So, some of the information and uh, or some of the products that could be made from it. Sure. And while they were doing that, they were hiding it from the public, saying that it had no medical use. Unbelievable. You know, unethical. Still they, to this day. Still to this day, that's their stance. Yep. Yep. Right? Because, you know, they were stopping doctors, basically stopping doctors from treating their patients. They... they I think that to this, you know, there's no t limitation time on homicide. I think some of these uh, cops and the prosecutors who were involved in that, who knew what the score was and were still trying to mess with people, I think that they should, um, you know, they, they should go into the cold case files. Well, you know what that sounds like to me is we talk about the war on drugs. I think it's time for them to have some war crimes then brought up against them. Yeah. And the Sacklers, too. Let's put the Sacklers in there. You know who oh. they are. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Murder. Murder yep. one. Murder it's, one. It's they paid it off. People. You know, I, I think they should take it out of the civil, put it into the criminal, seize all their money, and put them in prison. I mean, 100%. Not, you know, we're That's talking about they hundreds of thousands. They've killed hundreds of thousands of people. So the biggest heroin person, then, then they'll put you on trial. But if you kill hundreds of thousands, you pay your way out. I don't think that's the way to go. Right. Right. That's why we smoke and stuff. So back to the last prisoner project. Oh, one thing <laughs> I should tell you is that head shops do carry, I'm not head, grocery stores do carry the books a lot now because they're not going to be closed down. So that's really good. I mean, it wasn't their fault that they couldn't carry them. It was a question right. of uh, being closed down if you do it. Too. So that also meant that a bookstore couldn't carry rolling papers. <laughs> because if they carried rolling papers in the book, boom. <laughs> you know? so, Ed, when did that policy start of basically uh, you know, going after the grow shops? Because I feel like that persisted even to the 2010s quite frankly i you know i mean i was still yeah, feeling it in 2010 ago. 11 12 yeah well it started in the 80s 
almost could say it started even before that, not just even for that. Before then, but I mean, it really it got hot in the 80s, you know, and yeah. the, you know, uh, uh, and, and, well, Reagan, Carter started it, and then Reagan used it. I think like 84 is when that shit really got ramped up on yeah. the national stage. Yeah. And, um, you know, Carter, Carter owes the American people a, uh, an apology. He, when he was running for president, he said, no law should be more harmful to society than what it's trying to protect people against. So certainly sending people to prison is more harmful than letting them smoke, smoke pot. So, um, and then he's the one who actually started, it wasn't Reagan, it was Carter who started the war, that war on drugs. And um, he's never, you know, I think he's a good person, but he, he owes the American people an apology for that. And he should do it while he's still alive. It doesn't work as well when you're dead. Yeah, because there was like legalization uh, talks right around the time that Carter got elected. You know, right. it wasn't like it was but, a odd idea. Then, then it was under his regime that that they were uh, spraying paraquat on uh, in Mexican fields. And that's and horrible. Right. That, people, that right there is just that, another fucking. That's a fucking. Can we talk about that for a second? The government was literally poisoning, literally knowingly poisoning people. And not telling poison. them that they were doing it. Because yeah. what would happen as soon as it was sprayed, that they would harvest before the the plants deteriorated. And so they'd be se sending these paraquatted plants up to the US and they were the, the DEA wasn't telling people about it. They were letting not it go even through. warning people. Oh, let them die. They figure that's how you solve the problem. Yeah. You know, but, you know, they were protecting people because you all know that marijuana can kill people. Right? <laughs> you can get so, killed over it. If it Spartan, falls off a say, truck, maybe. You say, Spartan, you're laughing at me. You're saying, oh, that's not true. But if a bale of marijuana fell on you. Um, yeah, definitely. Wow, well, I'll, still, I'll exactly. still take it. It could kill you. Exactly. I don't know. I, if I could get my lighter going. Your yeah. own bullshit type joke. <laughs> if I could get my lighter going, I think I have a shot. <laughs> so happy, <laughs> you don't got that flint and steel on you at 24 7 just ailment. in case you got a smoke bowl. I was going to say, I've taken so much here. RSO, so many dabs, huge yeah. baseball bat size joints. And uh, I'm doing just fine. I'd, I'd just be my own rosin press, just start squeezing it together. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> oh. and, and I just watched cannabis work medicinally in front of my face yesterday because Sequence wasn't feeling well. I mean, terribly. He was just feeling terrible. He was nauseous. He was just not feeling well at all. And I was like, here, just take a couple rips off this bong i know it sounds terrible right now but it's gonna make you feel better and within five minutes he felt 150 percent better yeah. i was and... throwing up and wailing and moaning and everything <laughs> and then i was all better it's the only thing that helps me eat in the morning i so i swear it's I, I can't do anything without smoking so i i you get it and I'm, I'm so glad you're feeling better yeah oh, it's no, a terrible feeling better. yeah so, yeah, I rely great. on and this right. every morning to get me to eat. Troy will ask me what I want for breakfast and I'll be like, nothing. And I'll yeah. smoke something and then I'll be like, OK, I want to eat. Yeah, I yeah, have to so. have it. It, it <laughs> Otherwise, I'm sick to my stomach, almost throwing up. It's it's a definite must. Is it so an I'm appetite suppressant for, for anybody else? Because that's kind Enjoy. of some strains can be. Maybe it's a strain. Some are. Well, for me, it's. <laughs> So me, okay, so I I have found the older that I get, I don't get the munchies as bad the older I've gotten. Though I do say sometimes, depending on the strain, get a lot of munchies. But for the most part, it doesn't phase me like that. But it does help me like want encourage me to eat or give me an appetite to want to to in, to eat something. Whereas sure, other times I'm just like no, that. nothing. For me, it just enhances what's already going on. So if I'm not eating and I'm smoking, I'll just get high. It doesn't necessarily make me hungry. But if I'm high and then I eat something, if I make the mistake of eating something when I'm high, forget about it. I can't stop. I'm, I'm just especially if it's something craveable food like yeah, 
because I, it makes food taste 10 times better already. Right. Uh, I had to learn to smoke after I eat. Otherwise, I just want to keep eating. <laughs> you have a lot of THCB, yeah. THCB in your strains? Yeah. Uh, CBGA, uh, a little bit of THCB. I'm not sure. I wanted to ask, Ed, yeah, Ed, Ed what are you smoking? I saw you light something up over there. I'm smoking a um, an alcohol extract that has been is now a powder. Oh wow! Neat. And um, I don't know exactly how it was done. Was Are you on the cutting edge of cannabis? Tech? Yeah, just like he's got that crystalline dab. <laughs> I'm sorry, but, uh, but I'm putting it, I'm putting it in a pipe. Uh, the small in uh, this pipe. He's smoking straight hash, ladies and gentlemen. Don't let him yeah. fool you. <laughs> yeah, okay. So. Wow. Very cool. See. Sort of isolate. And is that your go-to lately? No. Um, it's very convenient because I was traveling and I didn't want to travel, you know, take um, leaf with me. Not, I mean, bud with me. So, uh, um, you know, vegetation. And, right. You know, this was very, this is very convenient. Cool. I prefer to have a little piece of bud on top of it. I mean, under it, you know, to put it on top of a little piece of bud. Does oh, that nice. give you like the kind of full experience of what it is just with a little added extra? Because that's kind of what I find through. about putting like some hash or something on top. Well, it's very convenient. <laughs> well, speaking of convenience, I, I you know, uh, I'm into convenience a lot, you know, just. So what do my my weed maps rep like back when I had one in like 2018 before they you know kicked the caregivers out? Um, he told me that you know across the entire country, people love pre rolls and vape pens. We talked about this earlier, and I wanted to bring it up because he told me it was because of <laughs> convenience, right? It's simply the convenience of it. It doesn't matter the quality. It doesn't matter even really the source. They just wanted the convenience. So how do we combat that? Because that seems like a race to the bottom to me. I don't agree with everything that you said there. And that is just a convenience. It, um, pre-rolls had to get out of being uh, baloney, you know, because that's what they were. You sweep everything up from the floor, you know, anything that you can't, that isn't part of the bud, you put it, you know, sometimes they were made out of leaf or trim leaves or, you know, uh -huh. But um, people realize that, yeah, it is very convenient to smoke, but I don't want to smoke that crap. I want a good butt. Uh, you know, I want good butt. And so um, I would say that a good proportion of the, um, of the uh, pre-rolls are made from smalls rather than, rather than trim leaves. I think that's fair to say. Um, I do think we have a quality issue right now here in Michigan with it. And I'll be honest, in my recent trip to San Diego, California, I would say that they also have a quality control issue with that. And I'm going to try to pull up the video and screen share it while you guys talk. Hey, look at Goddess's uh, comment. It's exactly what I said before in the pre-show. Uh, she says, I use vapes because I don't want to go around smelling like cannabis all the time. It's easier to keep on you and use it on the DL. Sure. And I would imagine that you can find pre rolls, but you got to find the specific company that makes good ones. And well, that's the thing. That's, this is where we go to Spartan. Stuff. Spartan, what'd you say for every cart? What? You hurt my heart. Every cart that hurts my heart, man. I mean, it's just garbage. Yeah. We're just. We're just well, adding so much garbage. Hey, man. Well, well, I, this I is think, cardboard. I think, I think there's a great role. There's a great role to be played by pre rolls. And. Well, you know, not, I'm not, yeah, I'm them, not opposed some to Some of them are so super premium now. They're made with fine bud, and then they put uh, either powder or extracts or, you know, they enhance them. So they're, they're, some of them are 30%, 35%. I, I don't, I don't see, see a problem with that. See, I'll show you. Let like me what show Tara's showing, because they got a nice story. Exactly. This here, look at this story. So this is cardboard. I, I have been like on the so um, men looking for things um, on pre rolls because I don't want to spend my money on bullshit. So I am all about like true bud, like serious, serious things. So Classic Roots has a great pre roll in many flavors 
One of them is Ethos um, Lemon OG Haze, but another one that I've come across that I am just in love with, and I am like seriously gone all over Michigan for the past couple weekends looking at these, is Glorious Cannabis. I'm going to shout these guys out. It's a bubble hash infused um, flower. Yes, shit. it's bubble hash infused. I know. So it's a little bit more, but for what's included in this for $20 is phenomenal. Every one of them that I've had has been great. The 24K is the best one I've had. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Really, really good ones. So, well, I mean, well, I for when you're talking, and I have been like, I've like been searching for pre rolls, like just because of it is convenience, just because I don't want to sit there and roll one. Maybe I don't have the flour to roll it. And that's in my, in our case right now, where we are, we, we're in a, we're in a camper. We're not growing right now for ourselves. So we have to out search everything. And, um, Sherbinsky, we've got some, uh, runs here, but, Honestly, classic roots. This glorious cannabis, Sherbinsky. That's MCM. Uh, we don't like that. Yeah, it's Sherbinsky. Ah, we don't like this. Yeah, I don't like Sherbinsky. Sherbins it's been okay. Yeah, I didn't care. Okay, okay fine. But it's here. been not that oh. bad. He's bailing. It's not that saying. bad. No. Yeah, get the Sherbinsky out. It's I don't not even know that why bad. I brought that thing over. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, it's your fault, huh? <laughs> Cheers. It's <laughs> not that bad. I've had others that have been worse. So on pre rolls, that's what we're talking about, and it wasn't that bad. It's a, it's a hard. Good you know, it is what it is. Though. You know, I've had a ton of pre rolls that I swear they've mixed it with tobacco. So for it's me to spliff. get even any kind of pre rolls that I want to like spend my money on, right now, glorious cannabis, classic roots, and. I mean, Hyman is okay, but I hate the damn name, and it's all right. You know, <laughs> it's name. a lot of Hyman's money. Hyman's trash. Hyman's trash. Okay, so a couple of the strains You're have been cool. okay, but, but I do boring. not need to pay I, for a glass I, tip, and I don't need to pay for the Hyman name. It's so oh, it, sm <laughs> it tastes like wood. It's, it's, Pencil no. shavings. I'm going to put it out there. I've had a bunch of them. Nope. They pack them in like I, cigars with the cedar. So far. The high, you know how they pack they cigars with the cedar lining? They did the same thing with those, so everything tastes like cedar. It's like, what the fuck are you thinking? Well, it's like when we were younger, oh, we would use those flavored wraps for your now. joints boy, because everything you said tasted that. like oh my gosh. So you would use a wrap or, you know, like uh, the big thing for a while was blunts. You know what I mean? If you just had some shitty ass stuff, you'd throw it in a blunt and, well, there you go. Now it tastes like You know, I can't do blunts because of the tobacco wrap. You know, unless you're a cigarette smoker, you're not going to like a blunt, I don't feel. Like, I don't know. Maybe that's me. I'm not a tobacco smoker, so I can't get on I can't hop on the blunt, you know, kind of thing. You know, what's going on with blunts with you? It's a way of getting you hooked on tobacco. That's true. That's what it yeah. is. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. and blunts should be totally discouraged. They should stores shouldn't sell them. Uh, I agree. I it doesn't taste good to me, so I don't want it. So for blunts with as part of the marijuana experience. I've and always said here's the thing, and here's the thing about tobacco. There are some um, chemical reactions that are a yes no type reaction in react to as a reaction to tobacco so it's a part of it isn't necessarily how much you smoke but whether you're getting that that smoke in and that's where people who got uh cancers from sites uh side stream smoke they got they had that react you know a lot of the uh, chemical reactions in the body were the those kinds of reactions the yes no reaction and that yes led to the cancers so I would say, I, when I uh, was meeting, when I uh, was uh, hanging with Snoop one day, you know, and he put, the, Big you know, flex. put, put he, he had a, uh, uh, he, he, had, he had some tobacco on it and um, we, we had a discussion about it. And I, I think that it affected him somewhat. You didn't chastise Snoop, did you? No, we were talking okay. about science. I mean, if there's one person to do it, it's fucking Ed Rose. Yeah, Can yeah. we agree no, on that? <laughs> no, you know, it, it, it's like it, it's like vaccinations in general. Like, 
you know that 95% um, of the people who are uh, in ICU and 95% of the people who die from uh, COVID right now are unvaccinated. So, um, so it's not a question, it's not a really a political question. It's a question of, you know, which group do you want to be in, the one that's more likely to die from COVID or the, or the other group? Right. So um, the thing about that I don't understand it and I don't understand about the Republican position on it is they're killing their own people. You know, mm -hmm. think about that. It's about, right now it's 2,500 people a day. That's about a million people a year. And it's not, don't think of it out of the 350 million, think of it out of the 100 million that has not had any vaccination. Yeah. So it's a much higher chance of getting sick or dying if you're not vaccinated. Right. So people can argue about it and how, you know, bad the, uh, the um, uh, pharmaceutical companies are and it's a government thing and all that. But, you know, like fact is fact and the people who are dying are unvac for the most part unvaccinated. I was talking about how lucky I've been being able to travel and go to shows and all of that sort of stuff. And so far, knock on wood, haven't uh, gotten it. But uh, we've had people here on the panel that are vaccinated and have gotten it. I've gotten it twice. Thankfully, <laughs> they're all okay, like you're saying. But uh, Whoop. Yeah. When you were you um, when you were uh, when you got it, did you have um, uh, was were you hospitalized for it? No, no. I uh, I had something about uh, 15 years ago that was very similar in symptoms and whatnot. And it was actually at the, around the same time H1N1 was going around. So I don't know if yeah. it had anything to do with that, but it was, I think, a little bit previous to it. Um but no, I, my symptoms that I had, you know, 15 years ago were way worse than the symptoms I had in the last year and a half or so. Um, and the first time I got it was way worse than the second well, time I got it. I'll be, you know, quite frank with that well, too. Oh, well, the first time you got it, you didn't have COVID. I'll tell you what you had. <laughs> you had Spanish flu. Sure. See, I mean, I have no idea what I no, had. I, <laughs> if you had it H1, sucked, though. If, if you had H1N1, they've determined that that... That's what's. Oh, you mean cool. like back in like 2007, 8, 9, whatever it was? No, 1918. Oh, no, I wasn't around then. I know. But that, <laughs> I'm saying when you, got that first, when you got that first one, it was the same disease as the Spanish flu in 1918. So you got the same bug. The same okay. bug. H1N1 is what they determined. Wow. That's what Spanish flu was. I got the H1N1. Okay. That was a rough one. So speaking of 1918, oh, sure. Ed, yeah. if there's anybody that you could smoke with, living or dead, right now that you have not smoked with, I know you've smoked with Snoop and a bunch of other, you know, obvious famous celebrities yeah. in the cannabis, yeah. cannabis industry and, and that, who would it be? Well, it's, this is, uh, I have to give you a story. Okay. So my brother is about five years older than me. But he graduated school before 1967. And he graduated school, got married, got a job, lived a middle class life, lives a middle class life. I was in school in 67, in, in the mid and late 60s. And that's when this cleavage happened where America split. It was over the war. It was the beginning of the women's move, not the beginning, but when all of these different movements got their uh, impetus, women's movement, environmental movement, racial justice, that had been going on, but it brought whites in for the first time, really. And um, so he didn't experience any of that, nor the music. He, he was still listening to Kingston Trio and things things like you know these folky type things right and he didn't he did wasn't affected by dylan for instance so now bringing it back to who i want to spoke 
smoke with. Our president is had the same experience as my brother. He he didn't experience the revolution the, the revolution. He didn't experience the anti-war movement. He didn't experience any of that stuff that changed America. You know, before then, uh, uh, couples didn't live together. I mean, you, you you know, you kissed and whatever, and then got married. I mean, that it, it wasn't it, all uh, all of the mores that we have in society today were came from the hippies the environmental movement, women's justice. I mean, they were all part of that hippie movement. And so the person that I'd like to smoke with is Biden, Joe Biden, and get him high and make him woke. Bring him some mushrooms, Ed. Bring him some fucking mushrooms, too. Right? I don't think I'll ever get there to do that. Would you? Uh, <laughs> we can. That, we can. Uh, that, we can try. That is, that's what I would want to do. I mean, like, some natural medicine. You know, like, that, like, where? Where are you? You know, I, I don't. Um, what's the uh, senator from New Jersey? Uh, during the during the debates, uh, I forget his name. The senator from New Jersey was one of the presidential ca- uh, candidates, and he said, uh, and Biden said. Um, I would uh, make um, I, Cory I would Booker decriminalize and maybe make it medical legal. And this other guy said, "You must be on drugs. I think you are on drugs." <laughs> <laughs> said something like that. You know, he was so far behind. Right. But Harris, well, how can I mean? This is Harris, the guy who wrote the law to put well, all Harris these people in jail. The uh, the initiative in California. I mean, it's not like she's any paragon of liberalism there so you know i think biden and turning biden around and you know the democrats say hey what are we going to do we're going to lose we're going to lose make it legal you won't lose yeah you know what if if they made it legal in this coming session of congress you think they'd lose but but how realistic is that? We we thought it was going to get legalized with Obama, right? We really it's all did. Like, about I, money. I about money. That, and, that was a you know, long time like, ago, Ed. You know what? Everybody likes Obama, and they and I think a lot of it is a racial thing about it, because you want to like him and everything, and he seems like a sweet guy. He had all those wars. He did all you know while he was like so sweet. All those drones were killing people. But he knew but, better than that. He knew, his, don't you think that he knew we couldn't win in Afghanistan? I have no idea what he was thinking, to be honest with you. you know, but his vice what, president was the, the, pre- the president now. Iraq, you know, now Iraq, you know, we did such a great job. Iraq hates us. You know, they vote with Iran. So, yeah. so um, yeah. I think that Biden needs needs to be woke. <laughs> yeah, we'll come with some Democrats, like it. The Democrats made it legal uh, federally um, and released the prisoners. They would win in every state. And I'll give you an example of it. You know, um, Trump won in Oklahoma. I think he got sixty seven percent of the vote. But marijuana got 70. You know, that's what I say. Marijuana is more popular than any politician. That's so fucking true. Yeah. You know, so what's your thoughts you know on what? federal they wouldn't, not, they wouldn't, the Democrats wouldn't lose one vote. They gain a lot of votes, but they wouldn't lose one vote if they made it legal. And how? What do you? What kind of legalization are you looking? Would you think would be a good legalization? Well, one of the things is no more prisoners. That's number. That should be one. number one. I agree. And number two is that it um, that there are no the, the banking, and that there are no federal laws against it. It's up to the states. That's what they. That's what. You know, the anti-abortion people want to do with abortion, make it up to the states, get it out of the, you know, the federal, you know, 
but doesn't God, that you're just hitting all the hot topics tonight? I love but it. I think if you hit, <laughs> yeah, well, I think I'm if a, you I'm federalize and leave it to the you know, state. I'm a pretty radical progressive person. That's you know, you live in the area that represents you, and so I live in the most radical city in the large city in the country, which is Oakland. But wouldn't just a blanket like, federal decriminalization be better? And then, you know, well, I think, no, I think it should be federal legalization so they could tax it. Well, or importing and crash the economy the for every about, business here the on the side. Taxing it. You know, there's a good reason to tax alcohol. That is to bring the price up so people don't drink as much and then to pay for all the damage that alcohol does to people. I agree. I mean, it does far, far more damage to people than the taxes on it. For right? sure. So what I'd rather do is I know that it would be taxed, but I would like to ha make sure that federally there's no law against personal cultivation. I like that. At any size? Well, you, you know, I don't, oh. I don't like plant counts. Because, okay, okay. because you're not scientific, right? You know, there's no science. You know, 100%. you can grow a plant this big or 24. Or, or breeding versus yeah. just growing but one strain of right. lake, you know? So what I'd like to see on personal use maybe is um, outdoors, maybe canopy size, and indoors, maybe um, uh, power, you know, light power. The restrictions that I'm seeing at local levels here at Michigan is they're doing percentages of your physical living space. So if you live in a house that's, say, 2,000 square feet, they limit you to a percentage of that, like 50% or something. They're also, like so what? They're also <laughs> limiting you based on your property size. So some municipalities um, are saying, yeah. if you don't have five acres, you're not, you're not allowed to go at all because that smell's going to drift to your neighbor. You we, know? Well, that's not personal the, cultivation. You're talking kitchen. about caregiver, which is... No. With the power... Oh, yeah, okay, kitchen. good point. Yeah, With the power the limitations... Listen, leave leave, um, leave the cooking to professional chefs. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm with that. Cooking, you know. mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Trader Joe is now my personal chef. <laughs> so so if, if you if you did it by power, what if you made your own power? Could you have unlimited? Well, that that they want to limit how much you're growing. So little hamsters so they would limit how much power you could devote to that uh, well so what that would just push power, everyone to though? led right because i can pull i mean <laughs> what, if, what if i what if i have my a solar power. farm what if i have a solar farm that could so, so, have a hamster farm so, so, so you're still limited we're by how much that. we're not talking about where the power is coming from we're talking about where it's being used Oh, I don't but like doesn't that, that kind of like matter? That. Isn't still, that the yeah, whole you're, point you're of it? That just seems like BS yeah. so you you just, you just want me to figure out what, yeah. You know, the, I'm not writing the law. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, but you're proposing okay. it, Ed. You, you are proposing it, it to the Don't propose that one. Right. Okay, <laughs> do another one. You know? Yeah, oh, yeah. But Spartan asked me, what What would I do? And I was answering. Yeah. You know, hey, it's hard questions at this time of night, all right? <laughs> well, I, yeah. I think that, you know, I think it's open to discussion. But but one thing is people have, in, you know, I, I oppose the law in Washington, state of Washington. And I was called all kinds of names for it. But the fact is that in Washington, it's the only uh, state with a legalization where people can't grow. Yeah, that's I terrible. I didn't want that to be a formula in other states either. But it's terrible that that the people in the marijuana movement s sacrificed the people of Washington to get a legalization measure passed. Yeah. I don't think that was right. Home growth should be and, first. And now people are suffering for it. Not, can you imagine being in a legal state and you can't grow? That, yeah. That would be frustrating. I think the early states to adopt had a lot of that, where they were like, they would take anything that the government was going to give them as long as it meant that they were going to have legal cannabis somehow. And yeah, that was, yeah. no, that, that's like, not really like Florida. Florida. It's vote by the people. The pe right. You know what? You, you could put any pro cannabis measure up, you know, that's positive towards cannabis, people will vote for it. Yeah. You know, look, they, in Oklahoma, it got 70% of the vote. Oklahoma, 
I mean, that's a MAGA state. I think it's kind of wild. Some of these states that do have home cultivation have such low plant cult counts, like four plants or so. I would imagine it would just mm -hmm. take forever to be able to find yourself your own, like, I don't know, even if you were to produce something that, that it has quantity, it would take you forever to find it, you know? That's how they work with lobby groups from usually our own people just from the commercial sector. They have these big commercial lobby groups that, are, that make, you know, they try to whittle away at home cultivation because they don't want people growing. They want people to go to the stores and buy it. I think, and I think as it gets legalized across states, they're learning too. So they're learning what to do and what not to do. So as new states go, they go and they get these guys that have been there through three states and they're like, oh yeah, do this, do this, keep it quiet until it's legal and then uh you know pounce on that state because you know i saw it in the hemp with florida they pretty much opened the doors for out-of-state importation so like anybody that had clones say across the border in georgia or wherever they just did that in michigan come right in and set up so it was really like not really for the Flor florida people so i don't know I, yeah well, they're, well, they're getting good at it well look in in uh in the United States the, and in the world, there are all these different size companies that are growing tomatoes from international companies to national companies, regional companies, farmers, even people in the backyard supplying restu uh, restaurant. But overall, in the United States, more tomatoes are grown by home growers than all of the commercial establishments. And that's what I'd like to see happen with cannabis. Dilly dilly. And, you know, just uh, by the way, just because you um, grow it doesn't mean that you're not going to go to a store to buy to buy it as well, because you might want, you know, a concentrate or gummies or something like that or whatever. Or you might want to try different varieties. So so. It, it's like it's sort of like uh, think of uh, people who might drink alcohol at home, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to drink in a bar. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, you can embrace all like aspects. Just, just... I'd like to see it. I'd like to see people have a place to go and be convivial, like a bar, but with. A, with um, happy pot, right? Yeah. So they call that here in Michigan a consumption club. They're just now getting licenses, and, and they're do, just now starting to pop up. I how many wait. do we have? Because I haven't Agreed. been to a single one, and that's I, like, I, I keep hearing, some of that. I keep reading stories. There's like one in Kalamazoo getting started. Now there's mm -hmm. still like um, Vehicle City Social. I would call that a consumption. club. I've been to Vehicle City and uh, AC3, uh, Genesee County Session Club. Genesee County, out, that's the other one I've been to. Mm -hmm. To Ed's point, it's really fun to go to those places. Oh, look at Ed oh, holding up that. That's it what, is totally fun to go to those places. I gotta say, I used to, I used to work cup. in the book industry. I used to actually work the machines to make those books. It's a great like a book. Perfect, a perfect Minder? bound book, and it's a pretty book. It yes, it's a great book. book. It's a great, perfect bound book. It's like, a, it's, and it's like a college textbook. It's like a college textbook. I mean, that could be... I can see Oaksterdam for sure using that for one of their nice books. Nice and I mean. shiny. You know, when everybody wants to see a book, you want to see a nice and shiny book. And that's a nice and shiny book. Well, I love uh, it. People, it. It draws my attention every time. Thank you. People from uh, uh, Oaksterdam help, helped with it. So oh, I know, man, I know I recognize a lot of names in there. It's really, it really... Man, I'm a big uh, guy about like community and things like that. Mm -hmm. When I see names that I've been following their videos or I follow them in Instagram and I see them in a book like that, it just makes me happy, man. Like seeing stuff like Chris Trump, you know, who's kind of on the cutting edge of KNF, seeing he had part of the book. And I mean, I could just name them all, but there's just a million people in there. I was really happy to see all the names and recognize them. So that was really cool. Well, it, th this book is. It couldn't be done by one person. It, it was, we had a writing team of three people, myself, Rob Flannery, who has a doctorate in um, plant science from Davis and um, runs Dr. Rob Farms. So he was co-author 
and Angela Baca, who uh, has uh, 12, many years experience in uh, cannabis writing. And so uh, the three of us, and then we engaged a lot of other people, about 20 other people to contribute to the book. And they, they made major contributions and um, helped with specific chapters. It was really great, great experience. It took 18 months. And, you know, I was lucky because of the pandemic. Because <laughs> when I wanted to call people, they were all home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're and, looking for stuff they, to do. They, they could, weren't traveling, so they were able to take some time and 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 write. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's some really cutting edge stuff in there. Like, uh, I was going to say gene editing, but no, uh, tissue culture. I was surprised to see tissue, a whole section on tissue culture in there, and some stuff that's just really not even talked about yet. So, um, I mean, we looked really it up uh, it. last time he was on the show. There was like I think 36 references to DLI in the book. You know what I mean? Like that. That's really only been what a year that we've been talking about that in our community. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. He's got a big section on terpenes. You'll like that. Yeah. There's a, like by the way, there's a new book on terpenes. It's called Hashtag. The Big Book of Terpenes. And if you want to get really serious textbook, textbooky, uh, I would suggest that book. I'm, I'm not involved with it. I, I, I just have a copy of it. It's called What's it called, Ed? The Big Book of Terpenes. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's an excellent book. Um, it's not showy. It's it's heavy text. Yeah, Ed, <laughs> Ed so I ordered, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of books off your website, and I ended up getting this with one of them, which I think is a fantastic, fantastic little gift that you in did, included. Did you there. order the second book from from uh, the site? I did, and it also had one, but I gifted that one to a friend. Oh. Okay, so I, I, I want to make sure that they both had had photos. They sure did. They I sure also did. had one too. I kept this photo. one, and yeah. I gave him the the other photo. Yeah. So well, I did take a gander at it, and they're they're both beautiful pictures. So thank so you very much. You, yeah, we send a photo with every book. I really and a bookmark. I loved it both. I bought both of them. I was like, fuck yes. There you go. Here's the bookmark. Yeah, there you go. It's got the yeah. saying on the back. There you go. I love that saying too. By the way, <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Ed. Appreciate you, brother. Ed, did you learn anything new when you were researching this book? And uh, what was your favorite thing that you learned? Well, we did um, we did a number of had a number of experiments done for us about uh, um, T uh, bud weight TH week by week by week bud weight um, THC uh, count. THC level, and um, so there's a whole graph uh, uh, showing it, it rise, and then um, like if you have a nine-week plant, generally it will rise on uh, it, uh, at a pre pretty steep scale till the seventh week, and then then um, th then the it rises, but not as much. So if you would and, and also it doesn't um, grow that, it doesn't put it that much weight on. So if you were growing for, for instance, for um, concentrates, you could cut two weeks off your, you could cut two weeks off your, uh, you know. The, the, your flower time. The, yeah. More efficient. Great, great. Like, so, but, but, but can we explain why, Ed? Because it, it may be diminishing returns after seven weeks. But what does that mean in terms of scalability, right? Is that means we get at least maybe one, if not two more harvests in every single year. And yeah. that's what people have to take into account. There's not trim crews. There's not dry rooms. You know, especially if you're going for fresh frozen, you're going right into a freezer. You got to have those. But we're talking... We're mm -hmm. talking up, upping your production, right? My only concern, yeah. though, is does that change the high? Like when you, I know when you harvest a plant early and you smoke that flower, it's usually way more racy, that kind of thing. Does that happen also with a concentrate or no? Does it well, not cure afterwards? Yeah, it, uh, that's uh, dealing with the terpenes. I don't think it matures anymore. Yeah. Like it doesn't go down the metabolite. I mean, yeah, it might oxidize, but it, I don't think it matures. You know what I'm saying? Well, uh, the as I said, we're talking about levels of THC. 
and the right. levels of THC don't go up much past. They go up a little past the seventh week, but they don't go. Oh, up. I was asking more broadly, like the high, the effect. Like, well, I was, well, I was my well, only we worry. Did, we did. We did not do. We did not do the experiments terpene for terpenes. We yeah, we do that. We will. But that, that's one of the things we were doing, and then. Um, Ed, can uh, I give you we, some quick we, anecdotal we, evidence? We did, we did something on triploids. You know what triploids are? I don't. I do not. Well, is that with a really funky head? Well, let, well, let me put out. it this way. Um, do you remember that grapes used to have seeds and tangerines used to have seeds? Mm -hmm. And they don't have seeds anymore? Right. right? And yeah. that's because of triploids. And here's how you make a triploid. You take some colchicine and you create plants that have doubled the number of chromosomes in them. So now instead of being diploids, they're tetraploids. And then you take the tetraploid plant and you cross it with a diploid plant, which is a regular plant, and it creates a triploid. And they are like mules, they they can't <clears throat> sterile or whatever. So you can pour pollen all over female triploid plant, and it won't do anything. You could, you don't have to sort seeds. I mean, if you so that'd be huge for field production too. Yeah, uh -huh. the implications of this have billions of dollars of value. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So anyway. So we go into that a little bit in the book, you know, just just little minor things like that that people might be interested in. It it's the first real textbook on cannabis, I think. But you know, the, I when you read it, you notice that it wasn't filled with a lot of jargon. It it was it kept that simple because you know people get put off uh, on science when you start using a lot of jargon and people say. This, I know this is English, but I don't understand right. what these words mean all together. Yeah, you got to pull a dictionary. So, so out we kept it, it so that we could um, uh, introduce the concepts without having to introduce all the jargon of it. So mm -hmm. that you know, you could start this book without knowing anything about a green plant, and still, step by step, it will take you right through that. And I so it's great, and also all the. We have a lot of, if for beginning people who are beginning, we have all those setups and how to set up your garden. Uh, uh, Bill Falconer, who uh, ran a store, uh, Room to Grow, and he wrote a book called uh, a Room to Grow, and uh, which is a book about how to set up your garden. He helped us with that with that chapter, as did R Ramo and other other people. It's really. Uh, it's really comprehensive in that it wants to gather the entire community. We, whether you're a beginner, whether you're just starting out with your first plant, or whether you've already grown before many times, and just up everybody's uh, uh, style. So, our so, cat agrees. They do not like. Yeah, and it was fun. It was fun to do the experiments and the research, and you know, and and uh, the ex grow grow plants and you know did you learn something that surprised you about the plant when you researched this new book it's plasticity that you know some plants that they'll only grow under one uh, one environment for instance orchids you know uh, I'm going to give you the secret of how to grow orchids really easily. Determine where you're going to put the orchid and what the environment is where that orchid is going to be, and then buy the orchid that likes that environment. And people will say, how can you grow those? But My mother-in-law approves, yeah. Yeah, right? So, uh, but... Cannabis I, I isn't like that. Right cannabis, now. you know, you can take it from one environment to the next environment to, you know. Do you feel it expresses itself differently that way? Yeah. It, the, the only, the, the time when it doesn't have much plasticity, let's say you're growing indoors and then you put it outside 
right uh, in the middle of the summer and it gets all that UV light. And that it's like taking a person, a light skinned person and putting them out for the first time in the sun in, in June, rather than building up, building it up. So I know how to need a, that for UV, the plants need somewhat of a buildup for that. that but but it's it's such a it, it you know it, it wants to grow it wants mo almost all varieties want to grow they want want to be vigorous and so uh, it's it's fun to grow them. Absolutely. Yep. It's addictive. I particularly like growing outside. Do you have a preference in how you grow, Ed, or how plants are grown? Like, do you, would you prefer they're grown in like the outdoor organic uh, in the soil way, or do you, do you uh, like the commercial cultivation too? Well, I like growing plants, and there are all kinds of fun ways to do it. Definitely, hydroponically as well as living soil, and you know, I like playing with all of them. Just so, like me, I love playing. I like to. I want to see what they'll do in all the situations yeah. and see what I can. Yeah. You know? I love that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Is there something that you would change about how cannabis is grown now, or the how um, just the industry has gone, the direction the industry has gone in general? Is there something you would change about it? Uh. You think we're on track? Well, well, you know, here's the thing: if you're going to have if you're going to have legalization and normalization and normalization, you're going to, then cannabis is going to go the same way that um, uh, that any other product goes. There'll be uh, some main very big distributors. There'll be smaller distribute it will be like farming you know like you know a lot of your uh, a lot of your fruits come with the name dole on them right mm -hmm. so you know there'll be some big ones and then i but i i anticipate what i think will really be fun is farmers markets right where right. the you know, I really wish they would allow that. That would be the especially with the new testing techniques. So you could, you know, you it, you can get an instant test, almost like so you get tested for the health aspect. You know, you all cannabis. I think all co commercial cannabis should be inspected for its health aspects. You know, like that it doesn't have E. coli or sure. metals or, metal. or any number, right. any number of other things. But then. Um, but I think that uh, people also have, you know, have a right to know what the percentages are. And, um, and there are all these new tools that are getting cheaper and cheaper so that it, we can get an instant reading of, the, uh, uh, of uh, THC, CBD, CBG, et cetera. And that, that would be really great, especially at farmers markets. I think yeah. that would be really fun. I think, and, I think those things are going to happen. But I mean, the first part, you can, the first part of it, of course, once again, is let's get them out. Let's get all the prisoners out. It's more, that's more important than the, just the commercial aspects of it. It's, you know, like to most of us in some way or another, whether we're religious or not, this is a sacred plan. I mean, in terms of its relationship with you, us personally and humans, right? We all agree with that. Any absolutely, sure. And sure. You know, so it is a commercial plant, though, and so we have to look at it in both ways. But I think part of it is a, that people should be allowed to grow to grow their own. And absolutely. As absolutely. growers, I think that everyone, if you. If you look back long enough or if you've grown long enough, you you know a friend or a fellow grower that's been impacted by the uh, the justice system against cannabis in one way or another. And uh, you can empathize with the people that didn't make it through and got stuck. Um, hopefully we can get them out of there. It's a Monday, Wednesday law.
at the same time i think most people when they start growing they, they tend to fall in love with it it's almost part of the therapy is the growing itself and that no matter what the law is a lot of these people will fucking grow the rest of their life no matter what anyway mm -hmm. growing cannabis stop like made me want to grow my own food and like become a lot more sovereign and you know truly like independent you know cannabis taught me a lot of that it really is a power, man. It, gives, it makes you feel so powerful to be able to grow your own food. You know, you can go in your backyard and, and feed yourself. The world can be going to shit, you know, during the the pandemic, you know. I was I felt pretty powerful to just go out in my raised beds that was made out of cannabis fucking root balls. <laughs> and I, I was harvesting vegetables out of it and, and eating, making soups and stews and and you know like Even 90 before the pandemic my... i've been uh doing veggies for years it's it's a great resource and yeah. everybody should hop on it hugo culture i i, I got, grew yeah. habaneros in a closet before love I it grew weed loved closet coming to spartan's to house out. to get squash and zucchini it was awesome and i did it was very little effort on my part i mean i just planted the things and they just took right off <laughs> the same, sometimes the same... you don't even have to plan them it's volunteer yeah, it's just the same skills I used in the garden. Yeah, organically I use out there. See what works. happens next year. I co-plant, exactly. co-plant with my garden. cannabis. Yeah, well, food and cannabis. Red knows like, what I'm talking about. I'm sure. I grow a lot of vegetables, uh, but I use hydroponic techniques. Oh, and nice. Outdoors. And, oh wow. And um, you know, I live in uh, northern Ca in Oakland. And uh, we don't get freezers there. And what I do is I heat the, well, can I, uh, here's how I, uh, here's how I grow it. I have the uh, hydroton, you know, the pebbles, and yeah. I have them in five, in three gallon bags. Okay. And the, the cannabis is in there. And I have a tray, uh, two by eight foot tray, and, um, uh, and, uh, um a, a uh, pieces of a pallet in in the tray to raise so that the the plants sit on the pallet but right. with water, with the tray water. Filled with water and i have a little pump it's a two watt two or three watt pump <laughs> 65 gallons an hour and it pu pumps the water from the tray up through the containers and then it trickles down, and it, they, there's also a wick system. The, the water also wicks up, but mostly it comes down, and it's always flowing through the plants. Now, the water is kept at 75 to 78 degrees, and usually you don't keep water at that temperature. It's pretty warm. Yeah. There's also big air spaces between those pebbles, you know, right. the big air spaces. It, yep. Even though the water can't hold oxygen, all the roots get oxygen right from the air that's drawn down as the water flows down. Makes so sense. anyway, all I have over it is a plastic cover. Is and it like a Dutch so bucket the system? Grow all went along that way. Do you like a mini hoop house kind of thing? What? Like a little hoop house type type deal? It's not even that. I I took. Uh, you know the things to make saw horses from that little. I took two of those, put uh, put uh, eight foot um, two by uh, uh, two by fours, eight foot two by fours on it, mm -hmm. and just draped it over that. Plastic nice. Over. nice. I, like I love it. that. Yeah, you just gave me a great idea. Yeah, yeah. I like that a lot. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I've made I make structures out of that stuff. <laughs> that's a great you idea make, like like you can make uh you can make a a, a, a eight by eight little structure at using uh using uh saw those saw horse, horse hinges yeah about um an hour and then and then uh, then i take eight foot wide plastic and wrap it around you know and then yeah piece for the top up. and then when you want to move it like if you put a, a, a white plastic on top of it and it you can move it if people are working in a field and they need a cool spot they can go into that it stays cool you know the 
and you can move it from place to place. You, you, you don't even, you know, you just fold it up and. That's cool. You yeah. can put some, put some chickens in that shit and then move around. Right. Keep them cool. Yeah. That's so, awesome. I love that idea. Yeah. I like all the DIY ideas for sure. Mm -hmm. Progress because of that. That would be so cool. So the way that you do it, you have one piece vertical. And then the other piece, which is longer than the first piece, goes at a diagonal. So that, oh, yeah. right? And then you have to triangulate all over. And you don't have to, but but if there's any wind or anything, it's nice to have it triangulated. Okay, you, wait do more that, you do that with like uh, with bolts and a, and and a, and wing nuts, so that you can just. Uh, you know, take those pieces off uh, onto the next spot. You can also take have four, um, you know, uh, strong people just uh, pick it up and walk. <laughs> now, now you're giving me an idea here. We we got a stoner cool. idea here. This is uh, awesome. You know, I, I've seen uh, like chicken coops and trailers before. Has anyone put a greenhouse on a trailer, just like a small, maybe four or eight plant grow, and just I don't know, moved it around for whatever reason, you know, maybe yeah, through the green season. Sounds green like a job for Tara. Remember Green Gene? He had a garden. I would love to college. do it. Oh my God, this is me. You know, actually, you know I, it. I know uh, somebody who had a, um, a, a truck, you know, a, a trailer truck parked. And, you know, it was like, you know, the container, those big gardens made from shipping containers. Mm -hmm. That's what he did in it. And, once in a while, he'd move it to a different area. <laughs> I like that. And he it would he said he told them that it's it's um, frozen and refrigerated and stuff like that. So they they, they weren't suspicious of the power. Nice. <laughs> That's really I remember cool. where I like Green Jeans Garden. That sounds yeah. right out my alley. <laughs> We're up here in the <laughs> north, and everything is frozen and. Nothing's growing here, so. But yeah, we would love for it to grow. I looked outside this morning. I saw strawberries already popping up, and I saw fucking irises. Oh, shut popping up! Off, popping off the ground. Yeah, it's fucking cold too. It's forty-two degrees. Oh my gosh! But so, we've Illinois, had two right? days. I'm in Michigan. Of, in the, late, the high forties, so I can see where that's happening. Two days yeah. within two weeks, so I can and see that. And it's right up front by my house, so it's probably getting some heat from the house. Yep, getting some heat from your house too. So, but I, I love it. Thinking of, thinking of the mobile plants, I remember Green Jean's garden. He had a little garden cart, and he put all his pots on it. I think he had like maybe six or eight plants on it, and he would push instead of you know doing a light dip, he would just push it into his shed. So that was his light dip. He just opened his shed push it into the shed when he wanted to flower it and then he'd take it out every day and pull it back out and using the sun for his for his light i thought that was awesome i'd be putting that shit on a winch on a timer or something there's no way i'm heading out there every single day <laughs> how about this what do you mean i'm looking put at that plants shed, every day put, for sure put the shed put the shed on wheels <laughs> hey there you go even <laughs> you can take it on vacation there you go. no the shed, no no when i say on wheels and or even on wheels on tracks and wheel the shed over the plants rather than bring the plants. Oh in. yeah. There you go. Don't want oh, to like balls, baby. Cause then you could be in the ground in the plants. That'd be even better. Right. That's how they there are some snowball. days in like Michigan it. where you can definitely get warmed up the past couple of days. We, or I shouldn't say couple of days, but we have definitely, I've been like, Oh my gosh, the heat coming off of the sun. I was like, Whoa, I'm warming so, up. Listen, so you know, there's definitely some good days to come. You know, uh, a, 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 a not a clear top, but a translucent top that lets all the light through yep. and white sides, right? You, uh -huh. you know, that would be awesome. And then yeah, if there's absolutely. a storm coming or something, you could roll it over during the day and protect the plants from the storm. Here's, here's, it up to here's, a here's, what, uh, here's what I would do with it, for, like in in winter areas, I would run lights. To bring, give the plants a lot of light between the sunlight that you're getting and artificial lights, and run the lights during the day, and only during the day period, so that people don't see, you know, a lot of, um, you know, the, the, 
you're not lighting up the sky, right? Right. Or, or you could have a light deprivation thing to have it on longer. But let's say you only have the lights on for 10 hours, right? Then to keep the plants from flowering, you just have to flash the light. It's all in the book. You just have to flash the lights once or twice during the evening. And when I say flash, like for a minute, and then um, it will keep the plants from flowering. And then right. when you want them to flower, you just stop doing that. So you can have your winter crop. That's cool. awesome. That's nice and trip. by the way, you know what? The, you know what one of the best um, reflective materials is? Styrofoam. You know, like styrofoam board. Uh -huh. It's extremely re reflective, 98% reflectivity. So you can, you, you know, you can use that for your, you know, the size of your container. That's a great tip. Yeah. So, you know, the collars that go around a, an animal. Yeah. When they're like trying to not like chew things off of them. People up here in the North have this around their trees. And I don't know if it's like reflective or if it's like trying to keep stuff off, but um, a lot of people up here in the North have these plastic like things around their power. trees their yeah, flowers hard. yeah it's, and it's a hardened plastic and i yeah. don't want to say pvc because you can see through it but yeah. it's up here in the north and it's like a dome all the way around yeah i don't know what it is that's good it's to keep the tree from scratching itself oh, it's probably got something is to do that with what it is Keep animals off of it. Yeah, I, I imagine animals. It's to keep the plant from chewing. I don't know. Is yeah, that what is that what that's... they're doing to keep the bears off of shit? I don't know. No, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, like, I'm telling you what I'm Wizard seeing up plant, here in like, the north. Shit. Yeah, they 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 hurt themselves. So I'm not sure. It's yeah. I mean, this cool. is like all up here into the tree. I mean, like we're talking like four or five feet up in the tree, like an enclosure around the base. Maybe they like, collect. A dome shape thing. Try to keep like. Uh, is it a nut tree? I keep all the fucking deer. Oh, I don't know. Deer yeah, I think rubbing, maybe it's a nut tree. I don't know. Deer, if you get a moose or antelope, well, and shit, squirrels, they're fucking rubbing bears, the trees. You know, bears, squirrels, bears, all kinds of. I don't know. I'm. We're new to the north. We don't know. We're seeing all these things, and we're like, "What the fuck's this shit?" Yeti. A caterpillar collector. Yeti. <laughs> it's a yeti. I don't know. I don't know. Serial Bigfoot. killers. We're curious. Just keep trees. Bigfoot off the tree. Yep. Ed, have you done any? So uh, we, any you know, I want to go. I want to go back to something that we talked about before. What's we that? were talking oh, about. Yeah. We were talking about blunts and pre rolls, but. Yeah. Uh, we uh, somebody mentioned uh, va uh, vapes, but um, mm -hmm. we didn't really go into it. What What do you think? I I, I, I don't like the disposable ones that you buy that are have a pre charged battery and you use them once and the entire thing goes in the trash. I think that that's really really bad. Um, I don't have a big issue with like the disposable cartridge itself, and then like a rechargeable battery. I think that's more eco friendly. Yeah, I, I hate the fact that it's that you smoke it and you're done. But on the ease of it, it's it's very convenient. It's very easy. I do like that, but I hate that I I gotta throw it out afterwards. That that burns my asshole up. So I I would totally love something that would be easy to use and still be efficient in in times, but. Yeah, I totally love yeah, the, the like rosin. You know, in in the oh, nicotine, damn you in the nicotine and your culture, Stop it! <laughs> the nicotine vaping culture. Stop it! They, they fill. I mean, they what what the, are they? The we have them. Uh, what are they? The strikers. Right. Yeah, I wonder if there was. Well, I once upon a time, Red, I had a an That's atomizer nice. that you could put on a vaporizer. And you could put concentrate in it and just hit concentrate. So but I haven't seen if, one if we were to like, I guess, talk about the normalization in this, in our case, I guess, and what we've been talking about a lot was uh, 
legalization. So in the regulated market, you definitely don't see that. Like that is something we could make ourselves. That's totally something we like. I have an old like nicotine atomizer. I'm sure I could just wash yeah. it out and utilize and use some like live resin in it. And that'd be great. That'd be really easy. Um, but that's you're right, guys. Like that that is another like wasted item that goes in um the trash when it could actually be a, like a, a different type of a you know uh standard set <clears throat> which would be like a refillable item like you you buy an atomizer and a... anyway uh ed what did you want to talk about vapes yeah, what are I'm sorry for about? talking about over talking the conversation here uh well when um they first started you know uh they were uh, they would uh, introduce glycerin into the uh, into the fluid to keep it to um, keep it uh, make it less viscous, and uh, I thought that was a really terrible thing. And I think that some like I, th I think most vapes are are pretty clean now. But I think that there are some that I don't, that are using additives to it, and I don't. I think that that isn't. Um, well, let's talk about the process because there's so many different ones. We're talking about rosin. We yeah, yeah hold on. Talking, go ahead. A Trevor. Additives, I, additives. Let's stop right there. Are are non plant cannabis plant derived terpenes additives? I mean, wouldn't that be considered an additive? They're definitely used. Well, they well, have to be re-added because through the process they've been removed, right? If it's a distillate yes. cartridge, yes. Well, I'm not talking so much about that, but uh, uh, actually um, secret ingredients that um, are, are not mentioned that are uh, that would have to be tested for to, to make uh, um, the contents more fluid. It would, Sure. And do you have any concern with like uh, cartridges, um, like heating up a metal coil, and you're you're taking the vapor off of a metal coil and that sort of thing? I know that there's been better and worse quality as far as the coils go, and some of them had heavy metal concerns and this and that. Uh, I'm no expert in this, but I'm uh, but I think that this is is an important topic. Sure. I'm not saying that. Oh, I have either the salute, the no, uh, much more than anybody here. Maybe less than some people here. That, but, uh, but I think that it is a topic of concern, and you know, I'd like to learn more about it. Actually, I don't well, think people are going to stop using them at any point. So uh, it's just hey. a measure of hopefully getting some version of that that's good for the environment. Sequence. Remember this: yeah, that they only are testing it. what's inside of these carts. They're not testing the carts themselves. So right. you're kind of on your own. And since that's not part of the testing, you rolls the dice. You know what I mean? That's where you you want to go with a a certain vendor that you've had good luck with. You know, on, in the chat, someone said that you know the ones from China taste funny. You know, and that's the thing is I've used these for years, like real early on man, seven, eight years ago when it would seem like they used to just use like RSO and they used to put it in there with like the PG. How long have you had that real bad cough? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no, no. So no, there's nothing like I the have, early dab coughs. Remember those? Ooh, yeah. it's in my I have three different versions here. I have a, a distillate version. I have a rosin version in a 510 thread. And then I have a rosin version in a what would you call this? The throwaway uh, kind uh, of battery striker, or I don't even know the name of it. I'm pod. sorry, but well, the pods you can buy new pods. Yeah, a pod. Right. Yeah. So out of all of everything that I love, I love this one, and I hate that it's a throwaway, but it's my favorite because it's such an easy use. But this one in the middle here is the same rosin that I would use in this thread right here. Same thing, just two different versions of it. That's all. Rosin, all right. both of them are rosin, but this is right here, a distillate here. So, well, hold on, let me get it. So yeah, well, distillate, rosin. What's the difference? Distillate in Troy's one. hands. 
Distillate and resin. Yeah, just words. Yeah, what's the, well, what's the difference? Is so we can explain it to people because so distillate just, has been distilled down, so it's yeah, can't, can't partial. All right, all right, hold on. Hold Come on, on. Yes, the resin is more <laughs> pure. Rosin is the whole plant still potentially. Yes, okay, I so definitely like, want a rosin based cart. If I if I'm gonna go with a cart, I want to go with a rosin based cart. Live resin, rosin based. I don't want to go with a distillate, but times are what they are. So we pick up things. So right here is what I don't want, but right here is what I want. Here, I agree. I like that little black, those little black things too. Yeah, I totally I love it. And so this one, I have had this, no, no lie. This one, hold on. I've had this for four months. Granted, I am not like for girlies going to the sucking on quick. this and using it like I, I would anything else. This is like my go to if I'm at the grocery or if I'm at the mall and I need a go to yeah, convenience. This is like, yeah, it's my convenience. Mm -hmm. But everything else that I do is that's not something that you can just have a battery. You can't just have that kind of battery and then just replace the pod. On that. Yeah, no. This is I've a one seen, time. It's out. Like it's that gone. With fillable pod, but then it would be a question of somebody giving you a product that's in a viscous form that you could just fill something with. That's what I'm talking but about. But um, this rosin right here, I will go back for every time, no matter what. I mean, I will look for this. This is what I will look for. This rosin in a pod every time. He's back. He's so, got a gun. He's got oh, a gun. Really? For he goes. back to uh, save. I told you he was going. Uh, he said I'm going. Distillate. Guys, I hate distillate. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> so this is a, a this actually runs essentially off of e nail. And this is a uh, heating pad that wraps around this giant syringe that I can control via uh, this little, you know, rotating dial here. And that'll give me half a gram one gram or two grams at a time per click of the trigger. Um, this is used for, give me a moment here. Oh, I only brought the batteries, but used for filling the cartridges similar to the pod style that fits in a, a battery like this. The batteries are reusable, rechargeable, the pods not so much. Now, let me tell you about the difference between distillate and a live resin, live rosin, what have you cartridge. A distillate, the distillate process basically takes BHO. It's extracted BHO, and typically this BHO comes from trim or just other garbage material. All they're trying to do is extract the THC out of it. So they take this giant run of BHO crude material, we'll call it. They run it through a winterization process to remove the fats and lipids, and then they run it through a, uh, a distillation process uh, after they run it through a rotovap to recover all the solvent, they put it through the distillation process and essentially boil it down through a steam distillation process into just THC or very close to it. It might be 90%. It might be 98%. It's a lot of THC, right? But in that process, you are heating up and decarboxylating the THC. And while you do that, you are killing every single terpene that came along with that plant. Now you might say, hey, Fergoli, this was trim, garbage, remediated, something bullcrap material in the first place, right? It might not even had any terpenes. Guess what? You're probably right about that. But just know that the THC that is going into those vape cartridges and those edibles that you're eating with distillate is likely coming from the garbage source material. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well done, sir. From black uh, and crude. You know, um, words matter. Bravo. And uh, thank you. Um, I wrote the first book that I wrote on any kind of concentrates was called Trash to Stash. Yeah, man. And uh, you know, it introduced a lot of people to the um, to the value of something that was called garbage before it was but, the last chapter but i don't think that uh i don't think that's fair because the thc that comes from that leaf 
is the same as the THC that comes from the bud. So is it not the same THC that comes out of that factory in Mississippi that's doing research on what we all agreed was low grade bud, right? I mean, it's all THC. And here's my point, Ed. Terpenes are the only thing that matter in this plant because THC is THC. It doesn't matter if it came from a strain that gave us a 30% value or a strain that gave us a 10% value. It's the terpene profile that modulates that THC percentage and gives us the effect that we receive. And I think that's what's important. And I think that's what we need to push for is testing and more research of terpenes because we know what THC is at this point. There's a lot of research to be done on it. Don't get me wrong. And there's a lot of other cannabinoids out there. But I think turbids are more important than we give them credit for. I have no disagreement with what you said, except for one thing. There are times when uh, THC is what's desired. You know, just THC. And those leaves will give you that THC. And it's the same THC as you would get from a bud. So I wouldn't call so I wouldn't call it garbage. I don't think that's right. I'm not discounting the value of THC. I'm just saying all THC is THC when it comes down to yeah. it. And a terpene profile is different for every single plant. That that's that's correct. And um, here's the other thing we mentioned before. What if we added um, terpenes that didn't come from cannabis, but were found in cannabis, to uh, to a distillate? That's what we have in vape carts. That's what yep. 99% of the vape carts are on the market. Okay. I'm not a fan of it. <laughs> there you go. You see that, Ed? Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, this might be a, a weird, this might be more of a, I don't even know what I want to call it, but I, I like to sit, think, think of it as a holistic approach. But I like to think that the medicinal qualities of the plant. Have already been figured out by the plant and are in the right qualities and quantities that they have mixed in it already the fight we'll call it the, the chemotype and the trouble that i have with distillates is that we're messing with those ratios and i think that's where we get into troubles with pharmaceuticals as we start trying to change nature a little bit so that we can patent and make money on it and we end up hurting ourselves in the long run so like i'm not opposed to concentrates obviously i mean i'm a, I'm a big fan of our so they make cannabis oil but i don't change the concentrates you know I don't, i'm not changing the ratios i'm not just dis distilling down you know one and mixing it with another but so but here's not I, think... I have a, it's not like i have an issue with other terpenes i just don't like mixing it with i don't like it mixing with what i've distilled from the plant on its own because i think it's going to change the ratios Hold, hold yeah, on. Have you ever added keef to a bowl, though? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I smoke straight, yeah, I've put straight keef in a bowl. I like that's one of my favorite things to smoke. Yeah, I, I think the point Ed's making off the comments I made was that THC by itself is still a valuable thing, and there's still a lot of research to be done with that. And maybe a 98% or something like that, whether it's inhaled or ingested, works for somebody, but that 10% might also work for somebody else. It's not and, always just terpenes either, though. That's a different, there, yeah, but it's also there's different. Alcohols, the esters, and then what Ed, you were just oh, talking oh. about the sulfur earlier, the volatile sulfur compounds that, that they were talking about. Yeah. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, those exist as well, and those aren't, to my knowledge, being put into um, distillate cartridges. I will say dabbing like diamonds, like pure diamonds, not like what for Groly makes, but like isolated diamonds is not a great experience. Like no. You know, crystals. No. Like no. a flavorless thing that, I mean, honestly doesn't really give yeah, you a It's totally bug. flavorless. Yeah, Nobody so. wants it. The worst thing you is have popping to have up terpenes a... added to it. And that's all I was going to argue with the Keith suggestion for Gurley is that's still full plant. I'm not getting just, th it's not like that's just THC. That's still full plant. You know, the same ratios, it might be concentrated because I'm not, I don't have as much, it's not diluted by plant material. It might be the last 50 yeah. plants I harvested yeah. in my trip, yeah. but, but you know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That too. You no, know, we, we do change the terpenes uh, that, we get from the plant depending on our drying methods. Right. And for instance, uh, I was at this science conference uh, and they were talking about drying methods and uh, uh, free using freeze drying uh, preserved um, um, 
plants tested after freeze drying had double the amount of terpenes as the next method, which was drying at 68 degrees. I, so, I, so, so depending on what method you use for drying, like for instance, if you do a fast dry at a high temperature, you're eliminating many of the terpenes. So right. you're changing the terpene ratios of the plant. Uh -huh. For that reason, I don't think that these terpene ratios are sacred. And especially you're losing the most volatile ones. Hold, hold yeah, on, right. though. You, you're losing mercine right away. Anything over 68 degrees, and it's going to start floating off. So, but what about someone that in in let's let's try to all remove our bias from concentrator flowers, the distillate pens or edibles or whatever it might be. If we're talking strictly terpenes here, the way I harvest 99, 98% of my plants is I harvest them, I strip off the fan leaves, leaves, I destem them, and I vac seal them to remove any chance of oxid oxidation, and I put them in a deep freezer that's negative 10 to negative 40 degrees. Is that not the best way to preserve? terpenes like mercine and other other terpenes and then immediately go to extract uh, extract them under the same temperatures if not lower because that is really what i'm trying to do is preserve the integrity of the plant while it's still alive right but at that perfect stage of you know what you would consider ripeness what's your testing numbers telling you are you seeing i'm that doing increase? it right <laughs> well, that's what i'm saying so his testing his like, testing numbers are going to be very day. high because he he's uh he, he's not giving the terpenes a chance to evaporate. Right. They're not volatilizing. And, I, and I'm a very different thing from the distillate process where you're basically taking away, you're taking a THC to like a pure product and then sprinkling on some like blueberry and having a blueberry cart. Like that's what people are against. And uh, you're doing a very different thing. I think of for Gurley's Lime Skunk. I've had it in both flower form and I've had it in concentrate form. And I love both, but there is definitely just like that horse hoof to the head kick of flavor that comes with the concentrate. Even though it does exist in the flower and it does come through, the experience is just so much better right. in the concentrate. Well, well I, I think that ultimately, especially medically, terpenes that aren't necessarily ever found in cannabis might be added to a cannabinoid uh formula to uh, provide certain um, new synergies on people, you know, and, uh, that, and um, I, I don't see anything. I mean, as long as people know what's going on, I mean, and it, it's on the label, I right. don't, I don't see, I don't have an ethical problem with introducing uh, either terpenes that are already found in cannabis to a distillate or perhaps terpenes that aren't found in cannabis, but might be uh, useful in the whole, uh, uh, with used with it. Yeah, and, I'm with you. I'm all for like freedom of choice. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's for sure. On the market, that's just not. Is the there a difference market. between those? those and terpenes? that's the thing. Is, is it, is it whether it's botanically derived, so to speak? I know that's the exactly. common label, or cannabis derived. Does that matter? And maybe not the profile specifically. The and I, again, like, I, I mix strains while I blast them. I don't breed, right. so I get to mix flavors and create new flavors every time I, I blast. Right, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I'm you know that's kind of what they're doing with terpenes, right? They're making their own profiles. But does it matter if they're cannabis derived or if they're from some rather random other industry? Are we talking science? Well, what effect do you get from a mango terpene when you smoke it, you know, or whatever? Sedative. <laughs> well, look, here's here's one that's more common. Limonene. I get that. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, you, you can buy limonene as a cleaner, you know. Right? I use it to clean my closed loop system, delimonene. Yeah. So, uh, so... I use Spartan it, Spot it's to readily available and it's found in cannabis, right? So, mm -hmm. so if you have if you have food grade limonene, is it ethical to add? You know, I, I had people argue that it isn't ethical to add, you know, a, a food grade uh, terpene derived from a different plant. 
to me, it, it's just not as long as it's labeled. Yeah, right. the labeling is the ethics question there, in my opinion. Yeah, but then you're you're relying on the consumer to be educated about what the difference is, and good good luck with that. You mean like all natural, like those all those fancy <laughs> words, <laughs> organic? Well, I, mean, what's I, mean, I, like, I still well, think there's so much limiting, disconnect. Limiting derived from lemon peels. Yeah, are you really educated on anything that you buy? I think there's enough disconnect between oh. uh, like like when you're using just terpenes and like thc or, or a distillate there's enough distillate there's enough disconnect from the plant itself that you might as well use artificial terpenes you might as well just use thca if that's the case and just blend it yourself because you're you've already gotten rid of the the rest of the plant you know you've already chosen the path of only only two methods of con only two types of things you can consume and that's terpenes and in a distillate or so, or or like a dab or of THCA, but and and you've completely gotten rid of it, like the live resin, or you've gotten rid of, you know, if it's a live resin, that's much better because now you've still gotten probably alcohols. You probably still have some of those probably it, volatile sulfur compounds. You probably have a lot more than just terpenes. You know, I feel like it goes from a cannabis extract to an ingredient. That's what it seems like to me. Yeah, yeah, it's just, just two ingredients, and that's you know. Good. Rather than you just took a plant candy. and made it into a uh, you know cane sugar. I yeah, haven't gotten which is fine. Okay, I haven't so, just smoking exactly, flour. Exactly, it is fine. Yeah. So look, yeah, so, flour. So, so you know, I've argued at times that we're all dead men walking for this yeah. reason. No, I no, not the reason you think. But why would people grow marijuana if they can brew it in yeast in three days? If they can brew the a, com a combination like let's say let's just say Blue Dream that they can buy yeast that when put into sugar water in three or four days will produce a combination that they got from Blue Dream. I don't make I, it into a joint right now. What? So look. Do I have to smoke for that? That sounds like some Judson's stuff. About, you know, the cannabis is a carrier for THC and the the entourage, right? So, mm -hmm. what if you? So we're we're not really interested in cannabis. When you think about it, we're interested in cannabinoids, um, the cannabinoids, and yeah, man, you, you cannabis know, is the vehicle. So what? So so rather than waiting a whole season for it or putting up lights and that whole costly thing of growing it. You take a container and uh, you add yeast to it and sugar water to it. Hold on, don't tell anybody. You could sell a class on this ad. <laughs> and five days later, you have Meryl, you know, the, the uh, THC and the entourage. Where's the fun in that? What? I, I, I just said the fun in that. Though. Fun? Hey, what's this is the interesting. fun in hanging out for 90 days bread. waiting for your plants to maybe produce? I got shit, oh, I got shit to do doing that. If, I, if I'm waiting on yeast, I'm going to watch TV for my nights. That's boring, pretty boring. Well, yeah, we're the growing show, right? Right? We like growing Yeah, yeah we like the growing part. The bubbles, I, would, you know? I would argue you that we don't even know. I would just argue that we don't even know all of the chemicals in the plant yet even so that it would be almost impossible to to mimic it completely and so it's it's just, missing, he's, oh he's just missing something what if though but I, I think we're so far from that point LSE. what if the yeast shit is better than the it's pure what if yeah. maybe we don't know well let me so smoke maybe, the LSE maybe. Now. exactly pure, like, everybody can pheno hunt so I'll try it out. Find new combos they can make yeast out of. I have an open mind. I'd try it, and then I give yeah, you my no. opinion. I have a total <laughs> open mind to yeast because I'm a vegetable grower, so I'm totally open minded to it. So, Ed, is this a hypothetical scenario, or is this no, a real no, scenario? no, no? This is real. Okay, and then because, how do you even just you know product? yeast? Yeast have a, a large nucleus, and so they could handle uh, the. You know the all the chemical um, things that the plant that the, they have to go through to produce THC, and you would probably have different yeast 
for each different ingredient that you're putting in. You want sure. some limonene, there it is. You want some myrcene, there it is, you know. And um, so you could take the whole uh, structure of um, making THC, you know, from, from the, and the yeast could do the whole thing. And it's a, it's sure, sure, it's basically fermenting. Uh, you know, you get a beer from that. So are you making, you're making it from the beer? Yeah, I was going to oh, say, how many okay. pounds per light are we getting on this kind of scenario? <laughs> There's no lights. <laughs> no, 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 I know, but I just want to know how much. Like it's something yeah. that would. Uh, be, make sense it would be scale, substantial. It how many pounds substantial. do you need? You know, a lot, a lot of a lot of uh, the medicines that, that are made now. Are what is it called? So people are gonna have giant stainless steel pots now in their house. They're just gonna fill. I already them. got it. Let's go. Hey, go the for go is just gonna be like. I what got the ovens fuck? and shit. I got sous vide. I just had a blue <laughs> dream. You know, here here's the deal: the uh, uh, the the breweries would convert to marijuana beer. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Can cool. you imagine the, the regulation tape there? Oh my god, it makes me fucking vomit oh, thinking. Wow. We had Marijuana some major beer. investment here into Michigan. Uh, and I can't drop any names. But my but... grandpa would be fucking driven. What about the investment for Goli? There was uh there was several people betting early on that uh cannabis beverages would be a, a thing here in Michigan. So several beverage lines got like commercial beverage lines got set up oh, in the yeah. state and they have oh, never wow. produced a thing. Hey, I do not doubt now. that. Yeah, they're, they're, they're getting so ready. <laughs> the I think the I think they're going through that red tape right now. SOPs are still yeah, yeah the lobbying you mean. Gibraltar Trade Center and Blake's. There's already that partnership yeah. that's going on with that. Do you know what happened with Gibraltar Trade Center before it was supposed to be a beverage thing? It was supposed to be a humongous fucking growth community. And do you Remember know why were... it's not? No. Was it because of zoning? No. So I got a little roof scoop like crazy. on the... Yeah, yeah. So the dun, whole dun, roof is dun. garbage. The cement was oh. like this thick, so it wasn't going to support oh. any kind of equipment. And I think think i mean this is allegedly i have no idea but i think they were dropping like a hundred grand per month just on taxes to hold on to that building holy oh, shit wow and that parking lot she's looking rough these days captain when you look over from uh 94 <laughs> yeah, man. yeah that, is that dude I that like 50 that foot statue it's solar? Yeah, your back it up on right, taxes good, good. See, that would be the good thing to do, though, is you could put him and kit him out with some cannabis gear and tie him back into the new thing, man. The Gibraltar man. There you go. And there's like a hundred foot Gibraltar. tall statue that's of this guy, like an old timey 1890s guy. Right on right off the express or I-94, like in between uh I don't know, I'm just north of Detroit, I guess. And and apparently it's going to be a beverage factory now. They they teamed up with Blake's uh, okay, Orchards right. or whatever, which is um, the uh, like one of the big apple orchards in southeastern Michigan. And they've been crushing it on that side of things for several, uh, I guess, a decade, maybe two decades now. Um, and from I haven't read really too much into it. I've only just been told uh, maybe Skillwell can give us more details. But from my understanding, it's like a I don't I don't know. What is it? Is it is it close to 100,000 square foot building? No, it's, it's huge. Pl it's pleasant trees, it's, it's and it's pleasant fucking trees. MCMA fucks, so Rush. we don't like Rush. them. Exactly. Okay, see, I, I haven't read into it. I, all I heard was Blake's <laughs> in a beverage factory, and it used to be a grow, and they, get, you know, that didn't work out. Hey, uh, it's Randy. It's hey, Randy. Ed. Randy Buckman. Hey, our buddy yeah. Randy Buckman over at Pleasant All right, we can Street. stop talking about this now. So how, how's your guys' gardens? Hey, <laughs> hey, hey, Ed, I had a question. You ever uh, get out to Michigan? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've yeah. been there any number of times. You, you Probably know, Ann Arbor. Yeah, Rory had that uh, the dispensary there, you know, in Arborside. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's my side. There was, and then uh, there was, you know, uh, the rallies in the spring, and um, also um, I was fascinated by Detroit. I mean, it was just. Was, that was an unbelievable, you know, some an experience that stood out to me. That how 
that city had been abandoned by uh, all these industries and, yeah, that's amazing. and left to die. And it was just, it was um, very it's emotional. Starting, it's starting to bounce back though. So it's cool to go around. Yeah, and it see is. It yeah, it's still here. We're still yeah. here. But yeah, the other thing that I have to say about the cat. is the Coney Islands that you have, you know, the American and the, uh, what's the other one? Liberty? Lafayette. National. Lafayette. And then oh, I meet any number of others. I'll tell you what. National. They, they, they deserve to get some, they deserve the equivalent of Tesla. <laughs> That's what they yeah. no. They, um, they yeah, are no doubt. Some yeah, have right. the, the the spread that sticks to the up the upper part of the thumb. <laughs> it's steam you buns, know, baby. Steam buns. Tell me about the bread. You know, you know, some bread. Some bread. You want you to put chili on it. So some of them, it, they're insipid. The, oh they, yeah, the so good. Detroiters deserve a a better deal than they're getting with any of those companies. They 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 deserve bankruptcy, you know, by real competition. They are so bad. <laughs> you know, they are so bad. <laughs> They're serving a 1940s meal. In fact, the refrigerators still have stuff from the 40s. They're okay. serving a 1940s meal. <laughs> this pie. This is a this is straight road. <laughs> it unbelievable. And, and, and they pride themselves on town. the insipidness, the 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 the, the um, chili with the. It is oh, chili. Man. It's chili soup. You know. <laughs> wait, wait, are we talking to Detroit chili or Flint chili? There's a difference. Pretending to be a roll. I don't know. You know. Oh my god! I love it. The, the critique <laughs> of the bread products is great. Yeah, can't, can't go so, for the chili thank dogs. You, Ed, thank you, Ed. You got to go for the pies. This, and I just have okay, a couple of things to say about this. Really anything quickly. until you pay choice, Cincinnati choice chili. Of, choice of franks and sausage. Choice of you give the you buy the sausage. You get all the condiments you want. You serve yourself to the condiments, and they you should have chili. That's thick and with beans. <laughs> Not thin chili. I'm, no, I'm it is. I've been you to these. You taste places. some Cincinnati it isn't chili. Just the, it isn't just two places. I actually have no. I have to find it, but I have notes on this. Oh my god! I, 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 I love it. Oh, it adds. And you next know, time you have to come to Jackson because we are the birthplace, supposedly, of the Coney Dog, and check out some of the places there. Oh, oh tomorrow I night, night. Yeah, I am on the fence of your Coney Dog. I mean, I so I on the fence, it, but Detroit. Detroit deserves better than what's being served. Up. <laughs> Ed, Ed, I'll Ed tell I'm you, offended. Many, many of so, nights have spent probably two, three a.m. sitting down. I have had everybody tell me I need to Lafayette. come to Detroit for a chili dog, and I have been disappointed because I am from Cincinnati and we are from Skyline. Oh God! Here Greek, we go. I, I, I'm sorry. The I'm done with this show, guys. Good luck. Spaghetti or lot, the chili. Listen, there are a lot of and, places. Here. There are a lot of places ha that have great chili. Oh dogs. my God! I know. I love it. Detroit isn't one of them. <laughs> no, Detroit is a different flavor. <laughs> it is way different. Everybody has their own styles. I'm not talking about way style. different. I'm talking about quality here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about American. quality too, and I'm going. With the American, Cincinnati quality, you go there for chili dogs either. You go there for not the burger. Detroit quality. Cheap hot dogs. Go to the city and just call it out like it's trash. Thirteen minutes. <laughs> Shush. I mean, somebody was talking about gar. You know, somebody was talking about garbage before. You know, and I said no. It's trash. <laughs> Ed's got to come to Cincinnati. Come to you Cincinnati. Know? Get the Dixie <laughs> chili. <laughs> Yeah. I'll, I'll have to describe well, you know, like those that don't know. There's two Coney yeah. Islands. Dude. Come on, Ed. Come to Cincinnati. You know, I come to Columbus every year to go to uh, Cultivate, which is held in Columbus in July. I think in July. And it's a, it's a nursery. It's not a marijuana show. It's a oh, nursery. I can't hear. And they have two. 
two oh, days here, here. of science symposiums on hemp before that show every year. And it's really worthwhile. Oh. So I do come out to Columbus, but Cincinnati is halfway across the state. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a really All flat right, guys, state. You can only drive 55. We, uh, we're well over time, so we got to kill this thing. You got anything to say, Ed, to finish this? Oh, uh, hey. Help, help my wife. She, she needs you to buy this book. So that, <laughs> Perfect. So that Perfect. we can have food on the table. Absolutely. Can you please buy it. Thank you. Thank I you think man. that if anybody who wants a book, it's uh, I think they'll find it um, worthwhile. Where can we uh, find it? I, I know we can get it on you know all the Android and Apple and bookstores and stuff like that. But where do you have a website? Yeah, just go on edrosenthal.com. And Perfect. You'll, you want to do that anyway? That way you get an awesome picture. Yeah, right. you, we give you the picture and um, all kind. Of, uh, now we're also giving away Bovita with it. Oh, yep, well. I got that too. I forgot oh, yeah. about that. I got some Bovitas too. Well, thanks yeah. so much for joining us, Ed. Yeah, yeah we're, so. we're trying to get more stuff in there, you and, know, and, and some discount coupons too to different things. So awesome. Perfect. Awesome. Idea. awesome idea. Thank you. Yeah, we're doing it like this soft introductions. Yeah. <laughs> so. Thank you very much for your time, Ed. Okay, thank you. Thank you.